Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Master Gardeners of Alameda County presentation on cool season gardening. Uh, our presenter today is Susan Fritz, and she has been an Alameda County Master Gardener since 2014 and has been gardening since childhood when she started learning from her parents how to care for ornamental plants. She grew up in a house on one of University of California agricultural field stations in the Central Valley, where her dad was a superintendent. Her love of plants extended to vegetables when she purchased her first home in Fremont. She grows a variety of berries, fruit trees, vegetables and herbs, and five raised beds in her backyard. She is also a lover of roses and has over 20 rose bushes in her garden. She is currently the assistant project lead for the Speakers Bureau of the Master Gardeners of Alameda County. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Maggie. I appreciate that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here this morning and glad that you could make it to our talk on cool season gardening. I'm going to go uh, get started right away. Um, we are going to be videoing this presentation, and so we ask that you make sure that you're muted and that your video is turned off. Um, we are going to be taking questions in the chat box, and so if you could type in your questions there, we would appreciate it. We do have a Master Gardener volunteer who will be collating your questions um, to provide them to me at the end of the talk. And at the half hour mark, I have a timer set. I will remind you to get your questions in to the chat box. Okay. The Alameda County Master Gardeners and Master Gardeners across California have a mission. And that is that the University of California does a lot of research. And we are the conduit to transfer that information to the public. And so we are responsible for sharing research-based information with you, the home gardener. And um, that's, our, that's our mission. We're all volunteers and we love doing this. So the topics that we'll cover today, why garden in cool weather? We'll cover climate zones, the first fall frost and last winter frost dates. We'll talk about the basic life cycle of plants site selection and soil preparation, watering, and then plant specifics. We'll talk about particular cool season crops. So why garden in cool weather? Well, you can have fresh vegetables year round. Uh, we live in the ideal climate for cool weather gardening. I know people that have uh, lived in Fremont, where I, where I live as well, uh, that tell me that they used to have fields of broccoli growing here commercially back in the 1950s and 1960s. And so we do have ideal weather for this. You get the opportunity to work outside, which in this time of COVID-19, I think is very important for our mental and physical health. And most of these crops are relatively easy to grow. So let's continue. We're going to talk about climate zones. Now there are two uh, climate zone systems that are used in the West. The first one is the USDA plant hardiness zones. And this covers the entire United States. There are 20 of these zones and they're based on the average low temperatures over a 30 year period of time. And 16 of these zones exist in California. And what I've done is I've given you examples of various cities in Alameda County so you can kind of get an idea of what zone you are likely in. And if you want to get more specific, you can go on the USDA website and type in your zip code and get the exact um, zone for your particular city. The other way that we look at climate is with the sunset zones. And there are 24 of these, but they take many things into account. Temperature, daylight hours, elevation, ocean influence, precipitation, and microclimates. That's a lot of different things that they look at. 
and 20 of these um, exist in California. Now, obviously, with something that includes so many details, you would think, well, this is the one that I need to know for vegetable gardening. But that's not really the case. Actually, what you want to know is your USDA climate zone. And when we look at seed packets, we'll get a chance to take a look at and see why that's the case. So once you know your climate zone, you can then figure out when to expect frost in your area. And so we're going to continue on to talk about the first fall frost and last winter frost. But the first thing I'd like to do is do our first polling question. And that is, what is your level of gardening experience? So Maggie, if you could share those results, that would be great. Uh, so Susan, the polls uh, are actually not working. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I need to have the host. It's not showing up. Okay. I can see them though, and I can stop the sharing. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we're, we'll be fine. So there is a small percentage of you that have never grown a garden before. So I think you'll probably learn a lot today. And 32% of you are novices. So that group of people that don't have a lot of experience is pretty high. And then over half of you have a lot of experience. So that's wonderful. I'm going to stop sharing these results and move on in my talk. So we're talking about the first fall frost and last winter frost. And you'll want to write these dates down. So for zone 9B, that date is December 15th, and it's the same for zone 10A. So this is the date on which we would expect, on average, to have a possible cold night. And then the last winter frost date, again, something important for you to write down. For zone 9B, that date is February 15th, and for zone 10A, it's January 31st. So if you look at the number of frost-free days we have, that's between 305 and 320 days. That's a lot of days when you can grow vegetables. You think about a state like Minnesota, where they have you know, maybe a four-month growing season. We are really, really fortunate to be in an area when we can grow for uh, so many days. And in some years, if we have a very mild winter, we could have the entire year be frost free. So those are important dates for you to record. So let's talk about your site selection and soil preparation. These are some gardening basics that you should consider when you're going to plant any garden, whether it's warm season or cool season. So sun and shade matter. Um, it definitely affects the performance of your crops. Uh, they need light. And typically for a warm season garden, you need at least eight hours of light per day. But for a cool season garden, you can probably get away with less than that, you know, around six hours or so. And you need to plan for seasonal variation in the shade and sun angle. Now, I took this picture at about 4.30 in the afternoon in the summer, and this zucchini plant gets about 11 hours of light per day. But I know, because my house is on the right side of this picture, I know that during fall that the, um, my house will actually place a shadow over this bed. And so it has a lot less light than it does during the summertime. So when you're considering where to put a garden, be sure to go outside every few hours during the day to see where the light is so that you can pick the best spot to place your garden. 
You need a water source nearby. All you need is a single water bib, especially if you're just starting out. Um, you know, you could go out and invest in all kinds of drip irrigation, but you really don't have to to begin. So we'll talk a little bit more about watering later on. Other things to consider, you want to make sure that your garden is close to your home. You know, if you have rented a raised bed at a community garden, make sure it's on your way to and from work or easy for you to access because you will need to devote time to your vegetable bed. You need to make a choice. Am I going to grow in raised beds, in containers, or directly in the ground? Now you can see in this photo that I have raised beds in my backyard. This one is three boards high. And when I first started out, they were only one board high. But as I've gotten older, I found I don't like kneeling so much. And so I now have fairly tall um, raised beds in my backyard. Containers, you can easily grow in containers. You have the option to move containers around where they can get the best light as well. Um, but we don't recommend that you purchase any containers smaller in size than eight inches in diameter. They really need to be able to contain enough soil to, for your vegetables to thrive. Or you can uh, garden directly in the ground. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. You also want to garden on level ground. If you're on a slope, it just makes life a lot more difficult. It's hard to keep water where it needs to be, and it's hard to keep the soil where it needs to be. So be aware of that. You should always choose level ground if you're going to put in a, a garden. So let's talk a little bit about preparing the soil and the components of soil. Soil is made up of four things, air and water. And most people don't think that plant roots need air, but they really do. And so the pore space of soil makes up 50% of the soil. That's where the water and the air exist. And then there's organic matter, which is a small amount, but that's called humus. That's dead bacterial cells, little dead insects, um, you know, decaying leaves, all of those things that you associate with organic matter. And then we have the mineral components of soil, which are basically ground up rocks. And so we have these four important things that make up soil, and we have ways of classifying soils. Some people have sandy soil, where if you add water to the soil, it drains away very quickly from the plant roots. Some people have clay soil, which means that the particles in the soil are very small, very fine, and they trap water very easily. And so you may actually have issues with standing water in clay soils. But the one thing that improves all kinds of soils is compost. I add compost to my garden every single year. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in this slide. But the most critical part of your soil is the top 6 to 12 inches. That's where your top soil is, and that's where you're going to be adding your compost. And your ultimate goal in adding compost to the soil is to achieve a soil that's just really easy to work with. I can put my shovel into one of my raised beds, and that soil is really light and fluffy. It, it drains water well. It holds water well as well. And um, so that's what your goal is. Now for container grown vegetables, we recommend that you purchase a planting mix. So now that we've gone that far, I'd like to do my second polling question. For vegetable gardening, what is the most important reason to use the USDA climate zones? Okay, so it looks like 87% of you understood that it was to determine the first fall frost and last winter frost dates. Remember that the USDA zones um, do not um, tell us how much rain you get, and they are 
the average low temperature, but that's not the critical reason why we want to know what our USDA climate zone is. It's so that we can figure out what the first fall frost and last winter frost dates are. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Talk about fertilizing the garden. So I have this schematic of a bag of fertilizer over here. And I wanted to point out to you these three numbers that are on the bag. These are required by law on any fertilizer that you purchase. And the numbers refer to the nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium levels in the fertilizer. We shorten that to NPK. And so when I look at this bag, if this is a 100 pound bag, I know that there will be 10 pounds of nitrogen, five pounds of phosphate, and five pounds of potassium in it. Now in California soils, we are primarily lacking in nitrogen. And so you wanna make sure that that number is higher than the others. You want to add your fertilizer initially at planting time and only if it's required. And how do you know if it's required? Well, you can send your soil out for testing. And if you go to our Alameda County Master Gardener Help Desk, they can give you some uh, resources for getting your garden tested. More is not better. Don't think that, oh, if I add twice as much, my plants will grow twice as fast. That's not the case. You have a choice between organic and conventional fertilizers. Now conventional fertilizers are inexpensive and they act very quickly, um, but some people uh, may not like them because they are uh, produced through the burning of methane in the presence of air. Organic materials tend to be more expensive, they act more slowly, and they most of the time will be from sustainable sources. So it's your choice as to which, which type to use. And of course, follow the package directions. The package will tell you how many square feet are to be covered by a certain number of pounds of this fertilizer. Or it may tell you, you know, add a tablespoon to the bottom of your planting hole for a transplant. So I am going to uh, ask my third polling question. What are some important considerations when choosing where to place a garden? Okay, it looks like 88% of you chose all of the above and that is correct. All of those things are important for considering uh, where to place a garden. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. So I'm going to summarize up to this point. So you have an idea of what you need to do with all these pieces and parts that I presented so far. So I have a shovel as my first uh, symbol of what I need to do. I need to turn my soil and I'm going to do that um, with a shovel. If you're gardening in the ground for the first time, you may want to use a rototiller, but only for this first time that you turn the soil. When I use a shovel, I know that that shovel blade is about six to eight inches deep. And so the top six to 12 inches of soil are the most important. I'm going to stick my shovel down at least six inches and I'm going to take that soil, I'm gonna place it on the soil next to it and I'm gonna do that down the entire row until I've completed a row. And then I'm gonna go down and do another row and another row. So I'll turn the soil one time. Then I'm going to add compost. I usually put in about a one and a half cubic foot bag of compost over an eight foot by four foot bed. And then I'm going to turn the soil again, the same way to mix the compost into the soil. And then I'm going to use a soil rake, not a leaf rake, a soil rake to level the soil and make sure that it's nice and level because otherwise you may get pooling water in different places and you don't want that. And then I have a decision to make. If I'm going to plant seeds, I usually broadcast the fertilizer over the entire bed that I'm going to plant. So if it tells me I need to add one pound to a, a 30 square foot um, area, then I will measure out a pound and I will sprinkle it over that size area. 
If I'm going to do transplants, I will follow the package directions to put fertilizer in the hole that I've created. So you turn the soil, you add compost, you turn the soil again, you rake it to level it, and then you decide when to add your fertilizer. Okay. So we're going to talk about the life cycle of plants and find out why this is important for cool season crops. So plants start off as seeds and they sprout, they grow, they set flowers, and the flowers then produce fruit, the plant dies, and the cycle starts all over again. Now, for summer grown vegetables, um, we typically grow the plant, we allow it to sprout, grow, flower, and set fruit. So think about a tomato plant. You're picking the fruit off the plant. Think about a zucchini. You're picking the fruit off the zucchini. But that's not the case with cool season crops. When we grow a cool season crop, we primarily sprout and grow and we harvest at this point. And why is that important to know? Well, when it comes to integrated pest management, we're looking at the importance of pollination. Do these plants need um, access to pollinators in order for them to produce what we want them to? No, they do not. Pollinators do not need access to these plants in order to produce what we want to harvest. So that means you can cover these crops to protect them from many pests, unlike um, summer grown vegetables. Okay, I think that we're ready for our fourth polling question. What are the basic steps in preparing soil for planting seeds? Okay, so it looks like 92% of you understood that we have several steps to follow. We turn the soil, we add compost, we turn the soil, we rake to level it, and then we add fertilizer and plant. Very good. Okay, so let's next talk about seeds and transplants. So we have two options um, when we plant our garden. We can do seeds, which are relatively inexpensive, or we can plant transplants, which cost more, but may save us some time. So we're going to take a look at some seed packets to help us figure out what we need to know. So this is a lettuce called Little Gem. And I know from personal experience that because this is smaller in size, a small lettuce, it works really well in pots. And then I have sugar snap peas, which are um, something I love to grow at this time of year. And they're, they're pretty easy to grow. Now let's take a look at some of the information on these packets. When to sow outside? It's recommended that you do it. Two to four weeks before your average last frost date and when soil temperature is at least 40 degrees Fahrenheit ideally between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Then if I go down a little further, it says mild climates. So in fall and winter for cool season, season harvest. So this is where you'll see that reference to the last frost date or the first fall frost. And the same thing for here, in mild climates, so in fall or winter for winter harvest, best grown in temperatures, uh, less than 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So this package tells me a lot of information about when to plant, but then it also tells me how to plant. For lettuce, it says seed depth of surface to one eighth of an inch, but for the peas, it says a depth of one inch. Now with this rule of thumb above, it says you should plant at two to four times the diameter of the seed. So what does that tell me about the size of these seeds? These lettuce seeds are very small. And the pea seeds are 
fairly large. They're probably about a quarter inch in diameter. It also tells me what spacing to use. For the lettuce, it says three seeds every six inches. So I literally place a tape measure on my soil and I plant six or three seeds every six inches. Now for the peas, it says every two inches. And then if you're planting in rows, it tells you how far apart to place them. And uh, this picture off to the side here is a tool that I use for planting seeds. It's called a dibble. And this end is used to create holes in the soil for planting seeds. So I would use this for planting the peas. I make a hole that's one inch deep and drop a seed in. Or for very fine seeds, I have this end that I can put the seeds in and then just tap them out into the soil um, at the rate that's required. Now I'm going to go on, but if you notice on this, it says thinning. When a half inch tall, thin to one every six inches. But on the peas, it says not required. And it also says on this lettuce when to start them inside. So if you're going to grow your own transplants, this is when you should do this. And when to start inside for peas is not recommended. So they're basically telling you, you really have to plant these outside. You don't have the option to grow a transplant. So let's go on to the next slide. So you've planted your lettuce seeds, three seeds every six inches, and yet it tells you to thin them. Hmm, that's an interesting concept. Well, I have a photo down here. And it actually shows, this is a cucumber plant, which is not a cool season crop, but it's good for demonstrating what I want to show you. Notice that these first two leaves down at the bottom have these nice rounded um, leaves. And those are called the seed leaves. They actually come out of the seed um, when the plant is uh, first growing. And the other leaves, if you notice, are very jagged on the edges. Those are the first set of true leaves. All of the leaves after that set will look jagged, just like those. And so when you're asked to thin, you may see something about, you know, after the first set of true leaves has appeared, you need to thin. Now for the lettuce, if I've planted three seeds every six inches, and it tells me to thin to every six inches, that means Every six inches, I'm going to remove, if I had perfect germination, two lettuce plants at every site where I planted three seeds. And I'm going to leave usually the largest plant behind. That's going to be, that's one going to grow to full size. Now with lettuce, you can take those little, um, those little plants and actually just eat them. So they're not wasted at all. Um, remember that we saw when to sow outside, and usually that will be days before the first fall frost date, and when to start inside, whether you're going to grow your own transplants or not. Now with the lettuce, if we know that the seeds are that small, and we literally only have to just lay them on the ground, just kind of press them into the soil, or just barely cover them with a little bit of soil, if you use a full blast of water on those, they're going to get displaced. And so you want to really use a fine mist of water on those small seeds. And um, you may have to go out a couple times a day to make sure that the seeds do not dry out before they germinate. Okay, so we have reached the half hour mark and I wanted to remind you to uh, please get your questions into the chat monitor and I am going to continue my talk. Um, and so again, please get your questions in as quickly as you can. So we're going to talk about next talk about selecting transplants. And when you go to the garden center, you'll see what we call a six pack or a four inch pot. Generally, four inch pots are more expensive per plant than six packs. But with a six pack, you have to consider, do I want to have six heads of lettuce all mature at the same time? That's up to you. If you think you can eat six heads of lettuce all at one time, great. 
Now, if you wanted to grow six heads of cabbage because you love to make sauerkraut, that's wonderful. Buy six heads of, of cabbage. Sorry about that. Um, so, but determine how much you want to purchase before you go. You want to look for plants that are that look healthy. They don't have yellow leaves. They don't look spindly. That they have plentiful green leaves. And if you take the the pot, you should look down in the bottom to see if there are any roots protruding from the bottom of the container. That can indicate that that plant has been in the container for a long time and that the roots may have circled and compacted inside the four inch pot. So you want to make sure that you are careful about that, um, not to purchase that kind of plant. And this can give you a head start over seeds. Like I have, for some reason, not managed to get any seeds in the soil yet. And I still have some time to do that, but I might um, do some transplants this year just because I haven't managed to have time out in the garden yet. So we'll talk about um, planting transplants, but I'd like to do the next polling question. And this is our fifth question. When during the life cycle of plants are most cool season vegetables harvested? Okay, so 74% of you understood from the uh, life cycle picture that it's after sprouting but before flowering. Now fruit does not set until after flowering and we generally do not grow cool season vegetables for their fruit. We're actually harvesting the plant itself. And so I'd like to point that out to you. Generally, we are not growing the plants for their fruit. We're actually harvesting the leaves the, and the root and the stalks of these plants, not any fruit they may produce. Okay, so the next topic is to talk about planting transplants. So we're going to dig a hole the depth and width of the plant, and we're going to add fertilizer based on what the package directions say. And carefully remove the transplant from its container, and I'd like to demonstrate how I would do that. You have to imagine that there's a plant growing here. Usually what I do is I place my hand around the stem, I turn the pot over, and I lift the pot away from the roots. And then I gently break up the roots, turn it over and place it in the planting hole. I fill in the dirt around until it's just above the level of the soil that was in the pot. And then I water it quite a bit to soak the soil, but I avoid spraying the plant itself. All right, let's move on. Watering. So ideally watering should do four things. It should be measurable. It should only be applied to the root zone. It should only be applied between the hours of 2 a.m. and 10 a.m. And it should be deep and infrequent. Now I'm gonna go back over each one of these. So the rule of thumb of 20 gallons per week for a four foot by eight foot plot is for a summer garden. That's sort of a starting place. But once we get into cool weather, you can generally almost always start at lower levels below 20 gallons. This is just sort of a place to, to know where you're starting. So you probably would not need to do 20 gallons per week during the cool season. It should only be applied to the root zone. So overhead watering is usually not great um, and it can waste water if it's overhead. So that's primarily why we say only to the root zone should only be applied between the hours of 2 a.m. and 10 a.m., and that's to help avoid evaporation. It should be deep and infrequent. So if we water deeply and infrequently, the roots of the plant will go deeper as well. And the ways that we can achieve these four things is by using drip watering or soaker hoses. Drip watering can be relatively expensive to put in. Soaker hoses are relatively inexpensive. However, they're not measurable but they do achieve all the other things if you put them on a timer. And so if you're just starting out, we recommend the use of soaker hoses um, with a timer um, to water your garden. Okay, let's talk about some specific cool season plants. Now the cabbage family 
is a very large family and there are lots of great vegetables in here that you can grow. Now, when I first moved into my home in Fremont, it was in September, and I decided I wanted to grow some cabbage, which I had never, ever done before. So I planted my cabbage, I waited for the head to form and all this stuff, and when it was time for me to harvest it, I went out, and I could tell that the cabbage did not do very well. I, uh, I cut the head in half, and I looked inside of it, and it was literally filled with cabbage aphids, and earwigs, obviously snails and slugs had slimed over it, and it was just, it was awful. And so I threw it away, and I never ever grew cabbage again until after I became a master gardener. And so some of these things that I'm going to talk about are what I learned from my investigations as a master gardener. So you want to plant these so that their heads form in cool weather. So you're you know, probably going to plant them you know, in, in mid-August through early September, and then the heads will form in the cooler weather. Um, they need moist, well-joined soil, frequent light doses of nitrogen. Obviously, you're growing this for its leaves and it, the head that it's going to form. And you need to rotate crops annually to prevent the buildup of diseases in the soil. Now, the next slide is probably the one that I learned the most about, and that is how to protect the cabbage plants that I grew from all of these pests that I found. Again, because the cabbage aphid is a little flying insect, cabbage loopers are actually the larva of those little white moths that you see flying around at this time of year. Um, cabbage worms and cabbage maggots, um, again, from flying insects. And so you can use a floating row cover to grow these crops. And that will prevent these flying insects from landing on your cabbage or something from that family. And so just learning that, I eliminated four different problems that I had in my garden. The next thing is by using copper banding, I could eliminate snails and slugs. Now, some people also will use diatomaceous earth, but if it's rainy, uh, diatomaceous earth doesn't work um, once it gets wet. So copper banding, I think, is really the way to go. And one way that we, I have done this is we purchased um, refrigerator copper tubing and just lay it um, in a series of screws along each of the beds that I have. Because the copper tape that I show in this picture is actually pretty expensive and does not last that long because it's so thin. Um, and so we found that this works really well and it uh, achieves um, protection for a long time. Now for the earwigs that I had, found that a low-sided can, could be a tuna can, cat food can, whatever you have, um, fill that with vegetable oil and a drop of bacon fat, and then bury it so that, um, you know, just the top of the, the opening is available, and the earwigs will crawl in, and then they drown in the vegetable oil. Or you can use a rolled up newspaper at nighttime, lay that out on the soil, and they will crawl inside, and the next morning you can go out and empty them into a bucket of soapy water. So that's what I learned about cabbage. Next thing is romaine lettuce. This is more nutritious than some other lettuces. And you can plant it at, um, you know, maybe a couple heads every couple of weeks. And it'll give you a, a head of, an average of a head of lettuce every week or more if your family really loves uh, lots of salads. Um, this is shallow rooted so that you need to be careful if you take a cultivator around this or you're weeding, be careful that you don't uproot the plant um, that you're trying to you know, eliminate the weeds from. Um, they like moist, well-drained soil. You need to feed it lightly and frequently. Frequently is probably every couple of weeks. And copper banding uh, does help against snails and slugs. Celery. Celery has very shallow roots. It needs constant moisture, constant moisture. I can't overemphasize that enough. It has to be fertilized every two to three weeks. It's in the ground for four plus months. 
you have to hill the soil around it to prevent it from falling over. Floating row covers work very well to prevent insect issues. And only grow this if you love a challenge. If you are an advanced gardener and you really want to try something that's difficult to grow, try celery. Most people can grow, you know, luscious leaves on the top, but the, the um, stalks will be dried out and tough. So give it a try if you love a challenge. Beets. These are very easy to grow, but you need to make sure that your soil, when you're turning it, uh, that you don't leave uh, lumps of soil behind or that there are um, rocks in the soil. Those need to be removed. They like evenly moist soil. Sow the seeds every four weeks. Um, so you can have a long harvest of beets. Harvest them when they're one to three inches in diameter. Don't wait until they're huge to harvest them. Otherwise, they'll be tough. So harvest them when they're relatively small. And use, again, floating row covers to prevent uh, pest issues. Carrots. I have a lot of cute photographs here of carrots. And uh, what these particular photos illustrate, uh, especially this one where you have, this one looks like it's uh, leaning back enjoying itself. And this one that's <laughs> been tied to a tree as if it's a um, <laughs> held for ransom. You need finely divided soil for carrots because if they come upon a pebble or something even small like that, they will divide. And so you need to make sure that your soil maybe is even sifted if you have to. Um, I like to mix carrots seeds with dry sand. And the reason that I do this is carrot seeds are extremely small. And so if you mix them with a quantity of sand, when you sprinkle it out on the soil, you won't get clumps of carrots. And because the roots themselves, uh, when you thin them, are uh, pretty delicate, you, you would want to be really careful when you thin them. A lot of times I just use scissors and cut the green parts off the top to thin. Um, but if you decide to pull the carrots to thin them, having the, the dry sand to spread out the seeds is very helpful. You need even soil moisture and no excess nitrogen. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of green growth on the top, and that means that the root itself won't grow. It's available in many colors. Um, the picture off to the right-hand side shows lots of different colors of carrots, not just orange. So give some of those a try. They're kind of fun to have different colors in there. And you begin harvesting those 30 to 40 days after you've planted them. Garlic, very easy to grow. And we plant that after um, October 15th. You harvest them when the tops begin to dry out about eight to nine months after planting. So you need to have a part of your garden that you need, that you can set aside for that length of time. Some people don't have that. So they may uh, actually plant their garlic out in amongst their uh, ornamental plants, which is okay too. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how to plant these. If you notice there's this tough outer skin that covers the entire head of garlic. So you should remove that. And then you separate out the largest cloves, leaving the papery skin on them. And if you notice in this picture, this is the root end that's going to go down in the soil. And that's what you're going to put down in the soil when you're planting. So what do I do with the center of the clove that I haven't planted? I take it inside and I use it for cooking. But make sure that you only use the largest cloves. Now you're going to, once these have grown for eight or nine months, so you know if you plant them in the fall, you'll be harvesting these sometime in July of the next year. You pull them out of the ground and you dry them in the shade for three weeks. You're going, once that time has passed, you're going to cut the stalk off the top, you're going to cut the roots off the bottom, and you're gonna brush the soil out of the bottom uh, to clean them up and then you can store them. 
Now for onions, the United States is divided up into three bands. And you have um, long day, intermediate day, and short day, depending on where you live. And the area that we live in is in the intermediate day section. So that's all you need to know about growing onions here in the Bay Area, intermediate day. Grow them from seeds or transplants. Onions are biennial, meaning it takes two years for them to go through the cycle of plant growth. And so if you buy those little sets that they sell, that is a plant that has already passed through its first year and is going into its second year. And what does it want to do based on the, um, the cycle that I showed you? It wants to flower, which is also means it wants to bolt. That's what bolting is. Plant wants to send up a flower when you don't want it to flower. And so this is what has happened to this particular onion plant. It has sent up all this green growth on the top and it has basically taken the life out of this bulb in the ground. You don't want that to happen, so you should plant this from seeds or transplants. Harvest when the tops fall over, you can see that photo, about six months after planting. So again, you're going to invest a, a part of your yard for, um, for this for a long time. Pull them from the ground and rest them on the ground for two to three days, and then cut the tops off and store them. And I think we're ready for another polling question. What are some ways to protect plants from small and large flying insect pests? Excellent, 100% of you got the right answer. That's, that makes me really happy because that was one of the most important things that I learned for growing cool season crops. And you can actually, uh, you can purchase the fabric and you can make your own hoops if you want to. You can use plastic piping, you can use metal wire, or you can actually buy floating row covers that are already constructed with the hoops and the fabric all together. Um, and you can buy them with fine netting as well, um, whichever you prefer. All right, we're going to move on to the last item I'm going to cover, and that is peas. Now, this is one of the few cool season crops that we grow for its fruit. If you notice, I have a flower down in the lower picture and it shows, oops, um, it shows the peas, which are the fruit of the pea plant. And so that is something that you cannot cover with a floating row cover because um, it does need to be pollinated. These are legumes, meaning that there are rhizobacteria in the soil that take soil nitrogen and change it into a form that the plant can use. And it, the bacteria do this by creating a nodule on the plant's roots um, to create a protective coating around them. And then they have make, basically make a little nitrogen making factory um, that the plant can use. And so these are practically self-fertilizing. You want to plant these in full sun. So keep that in mind. You want a sunny spot for these. You need to soak the seeds before you plant them, usually 12 to 24 hours beforehand. And if it's a vine type, because there are bush types of peas, you need to provide a trellis. And you can see in this photo above that um, they have, it looks like strung string um, for the pea plants to grow on. But you can purchase a trellis that's already made and just put it in the ground if you want to do that. Okay, so let's review all the things that we've covered in this talk. And it's quite a lot. We talked about zones. There are sunset zones and USDA zones, but USDA zones are the ones that we use for vegetable gardening. And in the Alameda County, we have zones 9B and 10A, or 9 and 10. You don't really have to have the letter designations. The first fall frost date is on average December 15th. That's a date you need to remember. The last winter frost for zone 9B is February 15th and January 31st for zone 10A. 
Your site selection is important. You need to consider sun, water access, level soil. Is it close to your home? And soil preparation. You want to turn the soil. You want to add compost. You want to turn the soil again. You want to level it, rake it level, and then decide, am I going to plant seeds or transplants? And that will determine when you add the fertilizer. Then you have to decide, am I going to plant seeds or am I going to plant transplants? And there are various reasons why you may choose one over the other. You're going to set up a watering system, hopefully with drip watering or with soaker hoses, and you're going to feed these plants regularly, usually every couple of weeks, and then harvest them. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk. And Connie, I believe that we will be ready for questions. Okay, give me a minute here. Right. I go down this list. There's about, I'm going to give you the most complicated questions. Oh boy. Let's see okay. here. You answered the first one. We wanted a repeat on frost dates. So you just answered that. That's great. Okay. Um, Here's one, how accurate is the hardiness zone forecast considering the microclimates of the Bay Area? Hmm. That's an interesting question. The, um, you know, we have a lot of variability in the area that we're growing. Um, obviously in Albany, they have coastal fog almost throughout the entire year and so you would think that would have a big impact and it does. Um, if you're thinking about growing a warm season garden there, you will have problems because of the lack of sunlight. But for a cool season garden, as long as you have light, um, I, I think that the USDA zones are very accurate, accurate enough for what we're doing for vegetable gardening. Okay, question number two. With possible future heat waves in August and September, what should I do to protect winter crop seedlings that don't like temps above 80 to 85? That's a really good question. Um, you can grow your own transplants. I have um, seed starting equipment out in my um, garden shed, but I realize that um, with this hot weather that we seem to keep having, um, and it's getting worse, it seems like every year because of global warming, we, um, you might need to bring those transplants into your house um, if you can provide a cooler temperature in there for them to grow. So that's what I would recommend. Or purchase transplants um, from the nursery. Do the row covers help if you are planting directly into the ground? Uh, yes, they do. Um, <clears throat> typically, I typically would wait um, to make sure that the plants have germinated um, and then I would cover them. Uh, just because, you know, they need a little bit warmer temperatures sometimes to germinate and the floating row cover can uh, prevent them from experiencing those warmer temperatures they may need. So. I, I would add it on after they've germinated. With the heat still here, next week it's still above 90 degrees average. Does that mean I should still, I still should not seed transplant in zone 9B yet? I would agree with that. If your warm temperatures are persisting, um, you may have a lot of problems with uh, the plants not growing as you want them to. For copper tubing, do you just lay it around the plant beds? No, actually what um, we figured out was, um, we started off, we put clips on the outside of our uh, raised beds, but those clips were made out of plastic and they basically cracked over time. So uh, my husband came up with the idea of just using long screws and screwed those into the side of the bed and he just lays the copper tubing um, um, on top of the, uh, the threads of the screws and that holds it in place and you can screw it down as much as you need it to to stay in place. But those work really well. You can, you can remove them, polish them up if you want to, put them back. 
Um, they last a long time. I've had the same copper tubing on my beds probably for 15 years. Okay, um, does floating cover shade the plants? I have less sun in the fall, so I'm worried that the cover will interfere with whatever of it is left. Okay, well, they do make um, the floating row covers out of varying materials. Um, they do have ones that have netting and they're not as solid as the white material is. Um, I don't, I haven't found that it interferes with the growth of the plants. But if you're concerned about that in your particular garden, you could purchase a fine netting material instead. Here is a fun question. What are your <laughs> thoughts on creating a garden journal? Is it helpful or not a good idea to use? I'm sorry, is it helpful or not a good use of time? If it is good, are there any places where you can find examples of what to put in the journal? Okay. There are many online tools for creating a garden journal, and I have a garden journal. And what generally what I have used in the past is an engineering notebook. It actually has graph paper on one side and lined paper on the other. And so what I do is I draw out my garden, um, each of my raised beds on the graph paper, and then on the page that faces it, that has the lines on it, I write down what I have grown, uh, when I planted, how many days until germination. So I keep track of those things. And that's really critical for keeping track of what you've planted where, because sometimes um, you get buildup of diseases in the soil, especially with um, you know, maybe tomato plants, and it's important to rotate your crops. And a garden journal will help you say, oh, that's what I planted there last. I really shouldn't plant it there again next year. I need to move it to another location. So a garden journal is an excellent idea. Um, keep track of exactly what you've planted and when. I have been told to water the ground away from the plant to keep the microorganisms alive. Do you recommend this? Um, no, that's, that's not critical to um, keeping your plants um, living well. You really only need to apply the water um, near the root zone of the plant. That's the most efficient way to use water. If you add compost and chicken or steer manure, do you need to add fertilizer as well? I usually do because with um, compost, I'm primarily adding it to improve my soil quality. Um, whereas the fertilizer, I'm you know guaranteeing that I have enough nitrogen in the soil for my plants to grow well. Um, now the thing with manures, is that number one, you wanna make sure that they are composted. You do not want to add uncomposted manures to a vegetable garden. And you should wait, especially with uh, chicken manures, I believe, at least six weeks because there is a fairly high salt level, I understand, in chicken manures that um, need to kind of be rinsed away um, in order for the plants to do well. So be very careful when adding manures to a vegetable garden. You could potentially increase E. coli counts in your soil from steer manures. You could possibly get salmonella from chicken manures. Are there any concerns with growing a vegetable garden near a freeway? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, if you have um, knowledge of how long the freeway has been there, uh, if it was existing during the time when there were leaded fuels being used, you may want to send your soil out for testing for lead to see if you're going to garden directly in the ground, do you have a lead contamination issue? So there is that concern. You may find out that there's no problem once you have it tested. 
but I would highly recommend that you have it tested. You can go to our help desk to get information about what laboratories may be available for that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and I hope you have an enjoyable rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Goodbye.